Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we've got an explosive roundup. That's why there's gigabyte power supplies on the table. Because we'll be talking about the RX 6600, the 6600 XT rumors, the 3050 and 3050 Ti rumors, and we'll be going over a lot of news for the week, like the new world MMO issues, uh, talking about MSI announcing its newest in-home cookware cases, and a couple of other things. A lot of hardware news this week, though, so let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Crucial, and it's Crucial X6 Portable SSD. We use these external SSDs all over the office for rapidly transferring games and files between systems. The X6 comes in 500 gigabytes, 1 terabyte, 2 terabyte, and 4 terabyte capacities with USB-A or USB Type-C for the cable. For a high-speed and high-capacity external drive from Crucial, click the link in the description below. First up, a quick GN update. So we shared a behind-the-scenes post on our Patreon page on patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you're curious for more details on some behind-the-scenes how stuff works. But for uh, just a sort of quick recap for everyone publicly, uh, we're going to take a brief publishing delay. I'll still be working, but need some time away from publishing, just a couple days probably, uh, so that I can get caught up on things like documenting testing processes, working on some of the renovation oversight for our new office. If you missed the video, we published a video previously where we're moving into a new space, but it's a complete disaster zone right now. <laughs> it's uh, It needs a lot of work. So we're at a point now where I can't oversee that and get it done in time and also keep publishing every day or almost every day. So we're going to take a couple day gap in there for me to work on that. And uh, the team will be working on some other stuff and, and content, of course, as we um, as we take a couple days off from publishing. But that'll also allow us some time to clean up a few things, like we need to get an air compressor ordered. Had a lot of great recommendations from the community on our YouTube community page. for uh, That'll be for our fan testing, automated fan testing equipment that's coming in. probably. October or something like that for when that arrives that we need the compressor in. So anyway, there's a lot of just miscellaneous things that need to be finished so that we can get these projects out of the way and get back to focusing on working on content. And uh, normally we don't take a break from publishing, but it's built up to a point where it's like, all right, I can't breathe anymore. So we need to, we need to take a quick gap here and work on that. The other reason I'm trying to take a break for a few days from publishing is so that I can leave the office because I've basically been living here for a while now and uh, need a break from it. So change of scenery, going to go do some downhill biking, and I'll probably post some videos on the GN Steve side channel. So if you care about that stuff, that'll be over on the side channel. Maybe I'll ramble about the hardware industry while riding down a mountain. Do that sometimes. Uh, but that'll be on the GN Steve channel. We'll link it below. And ultimately, just kind of need a break from the 100 plus hour weeks of uh, literally only sleeping and being in the office. And then we'll be back. Uh, at full capacity. We should be starting with these power supplies once we're back. So that's what's coming up. Uh, additionally, we have restocked the bar runners. So these have been crazy popular. Thank you for all the interest and support. You can find our bar runners on store.gamersnexus.net and it's a great way to support us, get something quality in return. It is a completely customized bar mat. So if you have like a home bar or something like that, uh, this has things like PCIe slots, RAM slots. We've got a CPU in there with uh, little yellow uh, gold pins that are sticking up out of it. And you can see things like capacitors, inductors, uh, FETs, all the usual stuff. Completely custom molded. We launched it a while ago. It's been really popular along with the uh, drinkware combo. And like I said, it's uh, just a, a unique, fun product. We worked hard on it back when uh, we first launched it. We talked about all the effort that went into it. And it's been a huge support, especially as we start to build funding for buying new testing equipment for our move, like that fan testing machine uh, and the compressor and things of that nature. So, all right, let's get into the news. MSI announces an oven. So MSI, you may have seen previously our review of the MSI Secura 500X. Uh, in the review, we said it's actually surprisingly high build quality that was completely marred by a lack of uh, engineering effort or knowledge of computers in general, uh, but it was a good start for quality. If you've been waiting with bated breath for the next MSI release to see how can the company improve on the thermals front, you don't need to wait much longer because MSI today announced its MP, this is a real name, it's MPG Quietude 100S. We, we assume Quietude is like attitude, except they put the word quiet, the front half of it, not really sure, but it's the MSI MPG Quietude. As a reminder, if you don't know what MPG stands for, it stands for 
MSI Performance Gaming. And if you don't know what MSI stands for, it stands for MicroStar International. So it is the MicroStar International MSI, MicroStar International Performance Gaming Quietude 100S. It's a, it's a self-contained acronym. Is it two? It's almost two self-contained acronyms, sort of. We're, we're, at, we're in GNU territory right now. That's where we are. We're in GNU, not Unix territory. Anyway, uh, this is, to make it really simple and easy to follow, the case, well, let's just, let's just take a look at the case. <sighs> Moving on, the next story is AMD is now more than 50% of the recommended pre-built from Puget Systems. Puget Systems has some of the more, actually, so just to be completely fair about it, the most in-depth testing out of any of the first parties we've seen for, for pre builds in general, or OEMs where uh, Puget has built the Adobe Premiere and Photoshop testing suites that work really well. We've compared them to our own testing suites that we built, and we've liked working with Puget. And the company also publishes a lot of guides on performance for different professional applications. Not really a gaming system builder, but they have a focus on workstations. So uh, getting the Puget recommendation here on AMD's side is substantial for one key reason. And that is AMD has had a lot of trouble getting into the pre-built and the OEM market. That's why you see things like 5600G, 5700G that we reviewed previously coming out in OEM systems many months before they launch for DIY. And that's because AMD is trying to get out in front of people who are in the more mainstream where they're not building their own computers. That's a problem that AMD talked about with us back at CES several years ago, where at this point they were on Ryzen 2000 series. They knew they had a pretty good product, but they just weren't getting out in the mainstream. And without that market, AMD wouldn't have been able to, to build enough uh, momentum to really keep competing with Intel at the level it is now. Puget tweeted the following. They said, quote, AMD has made enormous improvements in its CPU line year over year. In fact, more than 50% of our recommended systems are powered by AMD Ryzen or Threader for CPUs. Now, of course, Dell via Alienware has also been trying to use AMD in its computers recently. Uh, for example, it, it strapped a hockey puck to the bottom of an Intel cooler, uh, drilled some Intel holes in an AMD motherboard for a 5800X, and then strapped the Intel stock cooler plus hockey puck to the AMD CPU. So some companies approach it a little differently than others, uh, but they, Intel is um, also very creative. Uh, and that's about the best we can say about it for the Alienware system. Puget is recommending systems the 5950X, 5900X, 5800X, and 5600X, as would be expected, along with a few threader for systems. It does have Intel stuff as well, but AMD at this point is the majority of what Puget is recommending. Up next, mark this one as a rumor. Uh, we have been able to sort of slightly confirm bits and pieces of it, but it's, it's a rumor at this point. So 3dcenter.org published a tweet that listed, quote, a graphics card launch schedule for the rest of the year. The media outlet via its source claims that the new AMD Radeon RX 6600 and 6600 XT series video cards will launch in August to September. It is specifically noting August 11th for the RX 6600 XT and September or October at the latest for the 6600. That's a much wider range than the more pinpointed 6600 XT. Separately, the list included alleged launch dates of the 6700 for September to October and an RX 6500 XT launch by end of year. Configurations were rumored as ranging from 16 to 32 CUs and memory ranging from four to eight gigabytes, except for the 6700, which was listed as a six or 12 gigabyte configuration. The 3050 and 3050 Ti rumors have come back up. They were rumored for much earlier in the year and then disappeared, but they're back now. This is being referenced as before September. We've heard a lot less about the 3050 series, at least since the original rumors many months ago. And it's likely though that when AMD launches its similarly priced cards to whatever the 3050s will be, Nvidia will launch its 3050s either just before or just after. And that's just how these two companies always work. They tend to line up their launches around each other, often within a month, if not sooner. So whenever one of them launches, you can expect the other will come uh, in short order after that. So the uh, 3050 Ti, 3050, we don't really know much about yet. And to be fair, the 6500 XT being back out at end of year right now, that could move. We've seen video card launch dates slip a lot this year. Part of that is to do with supply. Uh, part of it is to do with just sort of customer relations where it's PR thing where it starts to look bad if you keep pushing cards to market. 
and you can't sustain inventory of the current ones. So anyway, these dates may slip, uh, but the ones that are sooner than later are probably more likely to be accurate. New World Beta, reportedly bricking and overheating video cards, especially RTX 3090s in the news. So this one was a real, it was not a flash in the pan, but it, it was a, a very rapidly developed story where in about a 20 hour period, the, the story here of video cards dying from the, of course, very well known Amazon MMO New World that everybody knew about before this week, sure, assuredly. Uh, the, it, the news came out that was killing video cards and just as rapidly as it started gaining traction, Amazon issued a patch that supposedly fixes it. We'll see how well that works uh, once it gets more widespread testing because you're going to be the one testing it if you're playing this game. Clearly Amazon not doing that part of the job. It launched in the form of an invite-only beta. It was off to a bad start though because it posed a significant risk to video cards, notably 3090s, although we saw some reports of AMD cards being affected, but when you're dealing with user reports on the internet, there's really not a great way to validate anything. EVGA and Gigabyte were the most prominent of reports that we saw. Users flooded Reddit and the New World forums with complaints of the game adversely affecting their cards. The issues ranged from mild crashes all the way to black screens and, of course, death of the device. Amazon, for its part, initially seemed reluctant to believe there was any correlation between its game and the card failures in a statement it sent out to press. That said, Amazon also noted the patch uh, would cap frame rates for in-game menus, as at least part of the problem seems to come from leaving the game running in the menu screens with no frame limiter. Now, there's a lot of speculation on this story. We posted on Twitter, <laughs> out of uh, frustration, I had to post this because we were starting to see some comments that were like, why hasn't GN covered this yet? Why are you covering for EVGA? So to be clear, uh, our approach to coverage is very simple. If we cannot add value to a story and we don't have any factual information, we generally don't say anything. And this was a story that at the time we didn't spend any time researching because I knew I had a trip coming up this weekend to try and get out of the office and not live here 24 seven. Uh, and this happened to align with it. And frankly, we knew that it would be a story that would develop every couple hours. And it did because by the time we would have gotten a video out, the issue would have been solved anyway. So. Our approach, our philosophy, just to be really clear with everyone, make sure everyone's on the same page. If we are unable to contribute meaningfully to the discussion, uh, if we have other things we're doing that we can't sideline, or if I don't want to because I am tired, then we won't cover an issue. Now, most likely, the reason we won't cover something isn't going to be because of tiredness, because that's the job, but rather because we don't think we can really dig anything up in investigation. The most we would have been able to do is run a video card and try to kill it. Uh, and the patch came out so fast, it was like a whiplash, that we wouldn't have probably reasonably been able to get in there to test it anyway. So we can't reasonably cover everything all the time. That's the reality of it. Reality check for anyone who thought that we can. We do our best and generally we're pretty good with it. But uh, this one in particular went by so fast and uh, I'm leaving in a couple hours here. So we're just like, it, we're not going to do this one. Anyway, there's some speculation out there as to what the specific cause was. We're not going to comment on any of those right now or bring them up until there is more information. Maybe in the next week's news recap, we'll talk about it if someone's able to confirm in a hard sense what's going on. But that's going to be difficult for independent media or testers to do at this point since the game has been updated. So you'd probably be relying on a manufacturer to say something. Either way, one thing we will say is this. Uh, as much as Amazon should have tested this game better to have found these issues, this ultimately is going to be a hardware manufacturer issue and it's in two forms. One is either it's an Nvidia issue and this is likely uh, part of it where Nvidia, uh, as we've seen in the past, has been running its 30 series cards right up against the limit to the extent that it had to issue driver updates basically immediately after launch of some of them because certain cards were unable to sustain the frequencies that they were running. So uh, that was fixed by drivers. That was an NVIDIA problem. It could be the case here too, where if they're still running too aggressively as these newer games come out and start getting played, uh, we're gonna see issues that didn't exist before on other games. So you know, Amazon and its game studio, the programmers there really shouldn't be able to write a power virus by accident. If that's happening, although yes, they should have tested it, uh, the reality is that NVIDIA at either a driver level or a firmware level should be preventing software 
from killing devices. That's a security concern where if you can kill a device that easily as poorly written code for a game, then what is, what is the implication there for security? What happens once malware starts getting distributed that executes uh, the same type of code to act maliciously and kill hardware? So that's a concern for NVIDIA. It could also be an issue for EVGA or for Gigabyte or for whatever other companies might have been affected by this, but Gigabyte and EVGA were the two we saw named, uh, mostly EVGA as noted. So it could be an issue with the hardware level design for them too. So beyond NVIDIA, there could be some board level issue. Um, definitely though, at the GPU silicon level via drivers, firmware, or the silicon itself, shouldn't be letting a game kill the, the device. But also Amazon, uh, poor little small upstart Amazon doesn't have the budget to test its video games. Up next, more right to repair news. This has been in the news a lot lately, and actually we still have our right to repair poster drive going, where if you buy one of our educational video card anatomy posters or our explosion and repair poster, the brand new one from store.gamersaccess.net, we are splitting 33% of the profits from the sale of either of those to the EFF or the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and to fight to repair. And we'll just link them below if you'd like to donate directly anyway. So the FTC, Recently, the current administration signed an executive order that, in part, is meant to target unfair and restrictive practices on self-repair or uh, third-party repairs. The order asked the FTC to draft new rules and regulations to limit just how much control the manufacturers have over interfering with independent repair and repair shops. The executive order came not long after a very long and very damning report from the FTC detailing what had been found regarding anti-competitive repair restrictions. Now, just a few days after that directive, the FTC has successfully and unanimously voted to approve a policy statement and move forward with addressing repair constrictions. The FTC chair said, quote, the FTC has a range of tools that it can use to root out unlawful repair restrictions and today's policy statement would commit us to move forward on this issue. Furthermore, the FTC said that the policy statement adopted today is aimed at manufacturers' practices that make it extremely difficult for purchasers to repair their products or shop around for other service providers to do it for them. The policy statement outlined by the FTC details key steps the group will take to combat anti-competitive and often blatantly illegal repair practices. Quote, while unlawful repair restrictions have generally not been an enforcement priority for the commission for a number of years, the commission has determined that it will devote more enforcement resources to combat these practices. Accordingly, the commission will now prioritize investigations into unlawful repair restrictions under relevant statutes such as the Magnuson-Moss Warranty Act and Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. The Magnuson-Moss Warranty Act is the one that has to do with warranty void if removed stickers and them being illegal. Uh, and the policy that's been written up recently urges consumers to submit complaints and information to aid in an effort to broadly enforce the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. And the FTC will also begin scrutinizing repair restrictions as they relate to other antitrust laws, such as the Sherman Act. The FTC also says, quote, it will bring an interdisciplinary approach to this issue using resources and expertise from throughout the agency to combat unlawful repair restrictions. The FTC will also closely coordinate with state law enforcement and policymakers to ensure compliance and to update existing law and regulation to advance the goal of open repair markets. Up next, plastic CPUs. According to a research paper published over at Nature, researchers at ARM in collaboration with Pragmatic or Pragmat uh, Integrated Circuit have achieved the world's first microprocessor based on plastic rather than silicon. The paper outlines two key factors in the rise of silicon for semiconductors specifically. It points out that it's widely available, it is relatively abundant, and it's relatively cheap uh, for the raw materials, that is. Plastic, however, as we know, is also naturally occurring and widely available. For example, it is our understanding that you can find plastic naturally growing and occurring in oceans, rivers, streams, and even humans and therefore it should be relatively easy to get access to for processors in the future. Silicon can also serve as a semiconductor or an insulator, depending on its configuration, so it's very widely applicable and useful as a material, but there's always room to research new opportunities. The research paper points out that while silicon is cheap, it may never be cheap enough for certain applications. Moreover, silicon is often brittle and inflexible, meaning it's ill-suited to be implemented in cheap, everyday objects or in biological applications. 
To that end, Plastic Arm is working towards advancing the use of non-silicon microcontrollers and microprocessors. Now, if Apple didn't already do such a good job at making sure its own products were already single use by restricting repair, we would suggest that maybe plastic silicon could be an alternative for Apple's single-use products. Here's a quote from the paper, quote, unlike conventional semiconductor devices, flexible electronic devices are built on substrates such as paper, plastic, or metal foil, and use active thin film semiconductor materials such as organics or metal oxides or amorphous silicon. They offer a number of advantages over crystalline silicon such as thinness, conformability, and low manufacturing costs. So as the TFTs or the thin film transistors can be built on top of flexible substrates, the purpose isn't to replace silicon, but rather to complement it. According to the paper, TFTs could enable the rise of novel form factors and cultivate a new range of applications for these types of processors. Plastic ARM specifically is an SOC that uses a 32-bit ARM microarchitecture and is based on ARM's M0 core design. As for the scope of what the other applications could be for something like Plastic ARM, the research paper posits uh, and ARM that examples could be disposable health monitoring applications or embedding microchips into things like milk cartons to monitor for chemical signs indicative of spoilage. Although maybe not everything needs to have electronics in it. But, uh, quote, as ultra-low cost microprocessors become commercially viable, all sorts of markets will open up with interesting use cases such as smart sensors, smart labels, and intelligent packaging. Products using these devices could help with, sustain <laughs> with sustainability by reducing food waste, be curious to see the research on that. Uh, could definitely see it. There's a lot of there's a lot of food waste. It's a huge problem. But using more electronics to do this, uh, it's it's creating waste for sake of removing waste. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. Up next, the Cooler Master Summit, the Summer Summit 2021. Cooler Master recently held an announcement event where it launched or announced several products, including a lot in the case category. It also has an interesting take on gaming chairs. One of them is $10,000. Looks like an egg or an incubator or something. Uh, the cases that are the most interesting to us. So Cooler Master had several case announcements. It added four new colorways to its existing NR200P line. The case itself is not new, but the colors are, and those are MITx cases. The company also said, quote, Cooler Master cases are known for pushing limits. That's definitely true. Some, some limits pushed better than others, but certainly Cooler Master pushes limits. All right, today we are looking at the Cooler Master uh, H500P. Okay, okay, we're not gonna... Oh man, that's actually the first time I've picked this up. Uh, open case bench thing, and it's a little bit heavy. It can be wall mounted, by the way. Generally, Cooler Master has been on an uptrend over the last few years. We had relatively positive reviews for most of the cases that came out. H500P Mesh, the H500 Blank, and the H500M, and actually the C700 series, were all good improvements that performed well. They had a few misses, like the MF700, but for the most part, Cooler Master's been moving in the right direction. One of the new cases announced is the Half 500, which is a return of the 2 by 200 millimeter front fan enclosure. Cooler Master's previous installations have been much better over the H500P previously, which was not a performance case, despite being the H500 performance, but whatever. The biggest change we noticed, though, was the top panel change here. The Half 500's top panel can be completely removed, similar to the Fantex cases of late, and it marks a great accessibility feature for accessing the top of the motherboard. This is a feature that we've really come to appreciate in those Fantex cases and the others that have done it, because it really lets you get in and work on things like EPS 12 volt cables without getting caught up on the heatsink and everything else once you've got the system built. Cooler Master also notes a 120 mil fan on top of the hard drive cage for more directional GPU cooling. This is an old idea, it's not new. Cooler Master did it back in the half X days as well. Uh, so it's come in and out of popularity over the years, but it's back now. The new Masterbox 500 case is claimed to be, quote, inspired by sci-fi battle suits, which we guess is the best lawsuit avoiding phrasing that Cooler Master could come up with. The case lacks CPU airflow at the top from what we can see, but maybe there's enough of a gap in the front panel for it to breathe. We'll need to test it though. Cooler Master also announced a couple of case accessories for graphics cards. It has the Master Accessory PCIe Gen 4 riser cable and Universal Vertical Graphics Card Holder Kit. Moving on, Cooler Master also unveiled its foray into gaming chairs with its Caliber line 
as well as its Motion One Hybrid, a collaboration with D-Box. Elsewhere in furniture, there were also Cooler Master branded gaming desks, whatever those are, as well as a new FreeSync monitors. Also the Orb X Pod, which is the 10 grand gaming egg. Of course, gaming tables, if you don't know, are actually required in order to play games. If you've ever died in a game or done generally poorly, you've seen your KD ratio slipping, it's probably because you're not using a gaming desk or a gaming table. They're well documented at this point for improving gaming performance. And uh, if they have LEDs, then you need to set them to certain colors depending on the type of gameplay you would like to experience. Now, we at GN have actually been working on innovating our own gaming furniture. We have a gaming ottoman, and we're working on building a gaming bookshelf. Uh, both of these, of course, will improve your frame rate and your KD ratio, so you can look for those on the market soon. Cooler Master also announced its usual updates and refinements to its core cooling line, such as the new Hyper H6 or H6DT ARGB air cooler and the Master Liquid ML240P or ML360P Flux AIOs. The Flux AIOs could be interesting as Cooler Master claims to have improved the flow rate and pump pressure to combat hot spots, and no, they do not use Flux for the liquid. Cooler Master is also entering the streaming market with its stream engine device, really trying to compete with Corsair here and its Elgato ownership. The stream engine, poor naming aside, is a live stream mixer meant to compete with Elgato's stream deck. Not to be confused with Valve's Steam Deck. Be careful when you're typing those into Google, you might buy the wrong thing. Microsoft's Direct Storage API coming to Windows 10. So in a developer blog post, Microsoft is either correcting itself or backpedaling. Uh, in a statement that it previously made about direct storage APIs being only available on Windows 11. Now Microsoft is attempting to clarify the situation, saying that direct storage will become available on Windows 10, but ultimately that users will have the most optimized experience on Windows 11. Microsoft's direct storage API is part of the Xbox Series XS Velocity architecture, and at a high level, it redirects I.O. requests for graphics assets directly to the GPU and it bypasses the CPU in the communication pipeline. This not only helps improve load times, but increases the amount of assets that can be rendered in real time instead of using in-game tricks to obscure the time it takes to load them in. According to Microsoft, direct storage will be available to users running Windows 10. And that's version 1909 and up. However, Microsoft notes that as Windows 11 has been built with direct storage in mind, users on Win 11 will benefit from new storage stack optimizations. By storage stacks, Microsoft is referring to the chain of drivers for a given device or storage volume. Presumably with Windows 11, there will be less overhead and theoretically improved system performance when using direct storage. And last up, we're talking about Global Foundries. Last week we talked about the uh, Intel rumored acquisition of Global Foundries. Global Foundries is also breaking ground in uh, the Northeast in the US for new fab. But, this week, Global Foundry is moving forward with a company-wide rebrand. It has announcements on that fab and increased capacity. Global Foundries has been teasing some sort of announcement for the past couple weeks via Twitter. And in light of the Intel acquisition rumor, many thought it could be an official announcement on that front. Instead, the company announced an updated look, logo branding, and so forth, that already seems to have been implemented across the company's physical locations and website. In addition to broad rebranding, Global Foundry CEO Tom Caulfield also announced new expansion plans for the company. The highlight of Global Foundry's expansion plans is breaking ground on a new fab in Malta, New York. The new facility will be a product of a private-public partnership between Global Foundries and the state of New York and will exist on the same campus as the Global Foundries Fab 8. Global Foundries didn't offer any details on the nature of the private-public partnership other than it would include, quote, customers, federal, and state investments. The announcement is being framed as a way to bolster domestic semiconductor manufacturing and address the global silicon shortage. Additionally, the company is set to invest $1 billion to increase wafer capacity of Fab 8 by 150,000 wafers per year, which would effectively double the site's annual wafer capacity. That's it for hardware news this week. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more or go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to grab a shirt like this one, the bar runners, posters, or mod mats. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for some behind the scenes posts and videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.